Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first of our T and Telecoms web, web chat series. And um, throughout the series, we're going to discuss a broad, a broad range of issues, including the telecoms legal framework, how the UK can digitally transform itself, and how the UK can future proof itself with digital security. Uh, today, we're going to talk about fixed line and wireless telecoms infrastructure and explore what the challenges and opportunities facing the UK are. Uh, with us today, we have Scott Logan from Brodie's, Neil Watt and Steve Smith, who are both from Farpoint Consultancy. Farpoint is an independent digital connectivity and technology infrastructure consultancy, supporting both the public and private sectors. Neil is a principal consultant in Farpoint and he heads up their connectivity practice. Steve is a senior consultant at Farpoint, working on the connectivity side of the business and also dealing with smart places. Scott Logan is a legal director in Brodie's uh, with a long track record advising and acting for telecoms operators and site providers in Scotland. And I'm Lucy Barnes and I'm a senior associate in Brodie's specialising in telecoms matters in England and Wales. So where are we today? There's been a huge shift in our consumer behaviours. We don't call one another anymore. We message in apps, we use phones for social media, and we need data. Operators have received no income from those apps that we use, but they are still expected to provide all of the infrastructure. Operators have had, therefore, to monetize data to make a profit. And we've had also had a couple of years now of the new telecoms code. Uh, and during that time, we've had Brexit, we've had COVID, 5G, and now we have Project Gigabit from government and also some proposed legislative changes to the telecoms code. So there's a lot there for us to unpack in terms of challenges and opportunities. But just going into the uh, changes to the telecoms code, Scott, can you give us um, a sort of a brief overview of the proposed changes to the code that are going to be in what's been called part two of the product and security and telecommunications infrastructure bill. That's a mouthful. Uh, Scott, <laughs> what, what are the changes? Uh, well, the, first of all, the bill follows on from the government's consultation earlier this year into further reforms of the code and seeks to address a number of problem areas that have arisen in relation to the 2017 update to the code. The consultation focused on three areas in particular, problems obtaining code agreements, rights to upgrade and share apparatus and renewal of expired agreements. And this is now reflected in the bill. So in relation to obtaining and using code agreements, a new procedure is proposed allowing operators to obtain code rights from unresponsive owners and occupiers. This builds on the, the recent reforms for leasehold premises and requires a series of warning notices to be given. And if the site provider remains un unresponsive throughout, the operator can then apply to the tribunal for imposed rights. The bill also proposes a change to the definition of occupier to deal with the situation where an operator is unable to secure code rights as it is already in occupation of the land. The changes here will allow operators to acquire code rights from the person having management or control of the land, which in most cases will be the landowner. In relation to upgrading and sharing apparatus, the existing automatic rights under paragraph 17 of the code have been retained, but changes have been made to paragraph three of the code to make it clear that sharing in itself is a code right. The bill also introduces a new automatic right for fixed line operators to upgrade and share underground apparatus. This new right will apply regardless of when the apparatus was installed and for apparatus installed before December 2003, regardless of whether an agreement is in place. The new right has similar limitations to the existing paragraph 17 right, but also requires prior notice to be given by way of a site notice at least 21 days in advance of upgrading or sharing commencing. However, if entry needs to be taken onto the land to upgrade or share, then this would need to be dealt with by a separate agreement. Then in relation to the renewal of expired agreements, 
The bill provides that the time limits for determining code disputes can be amended to allow renewal applications to be brought in line with the six month time limit that already applies in other code cases. The change that I mentioned to the definition of occupier also means that operators that cannot renew under the Part 5 modification procedure or in England and Wales under the Landlord and Tenant Act will be able to apply for and obtain new code rights under Part 4. And I'll just quickly mention the uh, proposed changes to alternative dispute resolution. Uh, whilst ADR will not be made mandatory, operators will be required to advise site providers of the availability of ADR and have to consider use of ADR before making an application to the tribunal. Any unreasonable refusal to engage in ADR by either party will be taken into account in any award of costs or expenses by the tribunal. And that's my very quick run through of the changes. <laughs> there's uh, there's quite a lot there, isn't there? Um, there is indeed, yeah. Uh, Neil, Scott talks there, you know, key key for us there, I think, for this discussion is the fixed line operators. And, and Scott talks there about the fixed line operators are to have automatic rights to upgrade and share apparatus, which is obviously a, a fundamental change. Presumably, this is a good thing for fixed line operators and, and what might it mean for the industry as a whole? Uh, yeah, well, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, indeed, uh, it's a welcomed upgrade uh, upgrade uh, for fixed line operators. Um, it's particularly nuanced, of course, it's it's for or mainly aimed at uh, you know mobile mass sites um, where there could have been a duct to a mass site uh, across land or just a directly buried cable. But where there's duct, um, you know, often or not, the agreement was quite specific if there was an agreement in place. And the agreement was quite specific about the size of duct and the cable within it. So then pulling a new cable through it needed new agreements, you know, et cetera. Mm. So now the automatic right to do that uh, will enable um, uh, operators, fixed line operators to uh, upgrade sites, particularly with fiber optic cable. So if the duct mm. exists, they can just get in and, and pull it through, um, providing, of course, they don't need to access the private land. Uh, as Scott said earlier, you, you still need an agreement uh, or authorization to access private land to, to pull that cable in. Um, many of the cables, of course, up to these sites were copper cables laid in, you know, in, in um, well, certainly in my timeline, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not for some for some of the younger ones on the call. Um, and of course, now with upgrading sites to 5G, et cetera, then it's really important that we get fibre uh, to them. So uh, it's, a, it's a welcome change that enables them to do that, um, um, uh, uh, you know, slightly easier. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, the proposed changes around the code uh, and the, the change, the automatic right for fixed line operators, it, it's all about this uh, desire to increase access to good coverage, you know, good connectivity. Um, and, and Steve, with those advantages that, that Neil's just highlighted, um, we know that this is driven by and it feeds into the government's agenda uh, for 85% gigabit coverage across the UK by 2025. Um, can you just give us a bit about what is Project Gigabit? Why is the coverage important? Um, and what, you know, what the drivers are there for it? Yeah, so hi. Um, the government's Project Gigabit um, is a, a whole raft of, of different things under that banner. Um, I guess the most obvious one is the upgrade of the fixed um, connectivity infrastructure to be gigabit capable. Um, and a lot of that will be done um, through industry's own commercial investment. You know, the investment that's going on through OpenReach, through Virgin Media, through City Fibre and, you know, many, many other altnet suppliers across the UK um, who are, you know, building full fibre gigabit capable networks. Um, but alongside that, it also is around um, you know, being prepared for the deployment of 5G and uh, making sure that, you know, the existing 4G sites are capable of being upgraded um, to support the new 5G infrastructure, um, both, you know, physically upgraded, you know, perhaps taller masts or, or wider masts that are more structurally able to deal with, you know, additional equipment. Um, but also, as, as Neil rightly says, you know, the rollout of things like 5G are predicated on having 
um, sufficient backhaul to those sites, um, which, you know, is absolutely going to be fiber based. So, you know, Project Gigabit en encompasses all of those things. Um, and as to why it's important, obviously, the UK wants to maintain its competitiveness with with the other nations of the world, um, many of whom um, have, you know, made rapid progress in deploying um, full fibre infrastructure. Um, the UK um, is, you know, is catching up quick. Um, we were maybe behind for a, for a little while. Um, and, and in truth, that's because we had um, lots of infrastructure that's been in the ground for a very long time. So it's quite complex to upgrade that, whereas, you know, some other areas um, had a more modern starting point. Um, but yeah, that, that's the government's policy. And um, that's where we're aiming for. Um, you know, the, the plan is 2025 to have 85% coverage of premises across the UK, um, or as many more as they can manage. Um, and then the longer term goal is by 2030 to have um, almost all premises covered. And yeah. and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a reduction, isn't it, from the initial proposal of a hundred percent coverage? And I wonder if you know the challenges that have come to the fore. Uh, people, you know, governments have to recalibrate slightly on, on its objectives. I think there's been a, a couple of a couple of yeah changes um, to to policy. Um, you know, some would see those as as a watering down, um, certainly. Um, Originally, the the goal was to have full fibre coverage, um, but then that didn't necessarily reflect the UK market and some of the major players in the market who, you know, were able to deliver, you know, some of those speeds without using fibre infrastructure because obviously mm. the technologies are available. So I think, you know, there, were, there was a recognition that maybe 100% was going to be too difficult to achieve within the time frame. Um, of full fibre, so that changed, and then they changed the definition from full fibre to gigabit cable um, to accommodate mm. some of their technologies. But yes, uh, certainly the challenges um, faced by the telecoms market is is one of the reasons why why those changes came about. Mm. And then, um, thanks for that, Steve. And then, if we if we look forwards and we say, okay. All, all these things are coming together. We've got Project Gigabit. There's been a, a ton of legislative change. And, and then we sort of unpack it in 85%, 100%, you know, from full fibre to gigabit capacity. Say, so, okay, well, what's the collaboration that's required across the industry to achieve these objectives? And I just wonder, Neil and Steve, you know, you guys are very much in the cold face of dealing with it. Uh, and so, if we say collaboration is key across the sex uh, across the sector, but there have been challenges there, and there are challenges. Um, what are some of the challenges in bringing, you know, the relevant parties, the operators, the site providers, and, for example, the local authorities together? I think well. Obviously, providing uh, gigabit connectivity um, across the UK, the target is 85%, as Steve said, working towards 100%. Um, a £5 billion project, of which £1.2 billion has been released in this parliamentary term. Um, but we have to think about what does 85% of the UK mean? Um, you need to look at that because you need to come down and 85% mm. of the UK um, that's not 85% of Wales or 85% of Scotland. It starts to get lower. Uh, if you look at Scotland, for instance, um, leaving aside that the, the um, SNP manifesto have also said 85% coverage in Scotland. But if you take the UK wide 85%, that might only be 70% in Scotland. And then that 70%, if you focus in on the Highlands and Islands, might be 65%. And if you focus then down to, say, the Orkney Isles, it might be 60%. So from a UK perspective, 85%, um, um, actually at a local level, can, can sometimes equate to a lot less. It can sometimes also equate to, to slightly more. We have quite a few operators um, uh, looking at commercial investment in the UK uh, to provide fixed line gigabit connectivity, and that's very welcomed. Quite a significant amount of investment coming into the UK, um, not only through uh, the incumbents such as Openreach and uh, Virgin, but also through City Fibre and many other alt nets. And 
collectively, uh, their plans may come to 80 to 85 percent or uh, anyway. So the UK government money can be used to hopefully push that at 85 or slightly further. But collaboratively working together, uh, well, yes, many of them, of course, are using um, uh, actually one of the original questions about fixed line operators, um, uh, those with significant market power, uh, such as open reach, et cetera, uh, the share their infrastructure now through the passive infrastructure agreement. Mm. There's kind of the collaboration there where many investors are coming in, uh, many altnets saying we want to invest, we want to bring optic fibre to certain towns, uh, cities and areas. And they're doing that through a combination of their own build and through uh, use of OpenReach's PIA. We have uh, local authorities obviously now well used to, through the NGA programme, of course, um, uh, which was the Superfast programme, uh, and now through the Gigabit programme, well used to dealing with um, uh, infrastructure providers in terms of um, uh, noticing, road work noticing, etc. And we have the barrier busting team, of course, we are looking at um, uh, certain issues uh, uh, that occur and how they can, um, uh, you know, uh, resolve them. Some of the issues we have, well, one of the ones is, of course, way leaves, um, uh, particularly for um, overhead, overhead apparatus. Mm-hmm. Uh, particular problem in Scotland, of course, um, uh, poles. Um, uh, poles predominantly in Scotland. Uh, not always, but predominantly in Scotland, are actually in um, uh, rear gardens. Uh, right. and of course, an altnet trying to access them needs to get way leave agreements from uh, everybody whose land that that kind of aerial cable passes. Um, so that can often be um, problematic um, for altnets trying to deploy using PIA and using BT's existing infrastructure, um, uh, pole infrastructure. Um, so, you know, there's one barrier there um, that has been looked at, but generally I think the collaboration uh, with with network operators is mainly through PIA with OpenReach, using existing duct, therefore minimising the need to dig up roads, etc. And I think through local authorities, where the local authorities are able to look at um, infrastructure providers when they move into an area, they can kind of work with them as a project. Um, uh, in terms of roadworks noticing and and which roads to um, you know to dig up or mm. able to at any particular times, in terms of other that's fixed lines. In terms of other means of delivery, and you know, it's, connectivity is not just fixed. It could be fixed or wireless, and the wireless term can cover many technologies. But when we come to talking about let's call it mass market broadband. Um, then we, we're really looking on the wireless, we're looking at fixed wireless access technologies. Mm. So there, again, it's back to uh, access to sites, the ability to share on existing sites, um, uh, local authorities uh, releasing assets or making assets available, uh, so such as public sector buildings uh, that you could put fixed wireless access on to serve communities. So uh, none of this is new uh, to mm. look um, they're all well used used to that kind of collaboration, I think. And I suppose um, it, it comes back to the, sorry, Steve. I was just going to say it just comes back to the fact that the legisl the legislative framework is just very important, isn't it? When when you're looking at access and and all all this all this fun stuff, I personally would like to be a part of that barrier buster team. I really like the sound of that team. I mean, one of the things that one of the things to, to, to put in is that, that the biggest challenge we face in the UK is our rural areas. Yeah. You know? And you know, if you liken that here to Scotland, we've got an added difficulty. We have islands. You know, yeah. and why should island communities be left behind? You know, um, in terms of you know, where we are here uh, and and uh, today, where we are, we're well situated in various parts of the UK, why should they be left behind? But the the level of investment to provide them with uh, connectivity is obviously far greater, and the challenges are far greater. You start to get into you know we spoke originally about code powers. But you now start to get into areas that have got triple SI, you know, where 
where it becomes a different a, a different uh, problem. Uh, you don't really have the automatic right to go build a mast in a triple SI site. Yeah. Well, lots of our rural communities in Wales, in the north of England, in Scotland are in triple I, uh, triple SI or conservation areas. So the problem comes slightly more expensive, takes slightly longer um, uh, to to actually solve. Yeah. And I think the other thing I would child. say, sorry, Lucia. Go on, Steve, go on. I, I think, you know, right, rightly or wrongly, I think at the moment some of the challenges are because the interactions are quite adversarial. Mm. So I, I think, you know, to, to be blunt, I think that the, the operators, um, you know, want to do things quickly. They want to do things at the lowest cost possible, um, you know, with the least number of barriers in their way. Um, I think... You know, for people who have, you know, assets, whether it's land, rooftops, or or what have you, um, I think they, you know, equally want to get the best value that they can for for their assets, and want to make sure that they're not being tied into, you know, agreements that are effectively impossible to get out of in in future. So, you know, the the whole discussion is, is quite adversarial, but I think that's where. The legislation is key to try and, you know, to try and remove some of the, um, you know, maybe yeah. ambiguity or, or option to interpret some of those things um, as, <laughs> as freely as they can be and and make it a much clearer cut, you know, set of decisions on, bo- on both parties. Um, yeah, and, and we... Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, you know, we'll touch on it another time, um, but it's it's what we all know what went before don't we so and I think that now what has come has altered the relationship and the dynamic so much that so many people who have dealt with what was before and and what's what is now what the framework is now it's taken time for people really to get their head around it and the collaborative point is a really important one isn't it because you you need to work of everybody needs to work within a legislative framework that government has given but we also need to recognize that the practical problems aren't going to be solved by that so if we look at some of the projects that you you know yourself and neil have been involved with the infralink the west mids and i know you guys have spoken previously about the dcms can you unpack some of those can you give us a bit of information um on how those projects have worked and the benefits yeah Yeah, i think fundamentally they all they all are trying to achieve the same thing and have gone about it in slightly different ways and and i guess you know at slightly different scales is probably what sets the different projects apart um you know if you take someone like the west midlands 5g guys who were um the, the initial 5g pilot as part of you know dcms's um 5G connected communities, then, you know, they they wanted to try and understand from, from industry what these challenges were, you know, from the communications operators, also understand, you know, from the, the public sector and, and other landowners and asset owners what their challenges were. And really, they've tried to, you know, bring those two parties together in, in a, you know, a bit of a safe environment, if I can call it that, <laughs> just, just to try and increase each other's understanding of, mm. you know, what what those challenges are and why they are a challenge, and and you know what practically can be done to try and overcome those. So, you know, some of those things are about having, um, you know, publishing information in a standard format that the, you know, both parties can can make use of. It's about standardising some of the processes and and making sure that there's a you know, a known point of contact um, so that these things don't get lost in, in what can be quite large organisations on, on both sides of the fence. Um, and that's something that's been replicated. You know, Glasgow City Council have done a really great job with their telecoms unit, um, you know, at a slightly different scale to West Midlands 5G, which covered, a you know, a number of councils across a, a local authority area. Um, and then, you know, Glasgow have kind of taken that and, and done it in, in the city. And, you know, again, made some standardised processes, looked at their internal, you know, how they deal with requests and and who actions them and, you know, what their approach is to 
um, you know, how much value they're seeking for assets, et cetera, um, and just built those relationships with the operators. Um, and in, Infralink have really taken some of those learnings more recently, um, some of our best practice that's been tried and tested elsewhere, and are looking at how they roll that out at a national scale across Scotland. So, you know, they're, they're currently ramping up at the moment um, with, with a view that actually, you know, if they can make the same kind of resources that West Midlands or Glasgow have made available in, in a smaller area, if they can make those available certainly nationally across Scotland, then, you know, that can only be a good thing and help overcome some of those same barriers. And actually, you know, so, some of the barriers are no one wants to be feeling like they've got a better or worse deal than someone else. And, you know, yeah. one of the advantages of the Infilling project is if everyone's working to more or less the same, um, you know, the same set of, you know, guidance and, and you know, how they arrive at a at a decision, um, then people don't have that, that, that concern about, you know, are they being treated differently to someone else? Again, on both sides of the fence from the asset owner's perspective, but also from the operators, they know, they know they're going to be treated the same you know, across the board. And um, and presumably as, you know, these projects, the Infralink, West Mid Skies, um, you know, Glasgow City Council, presumably as those sort of standards become, people become aware of them in different regions and different areas become aware, you do then develop a body of standards and... Yeah as the industry matures you know we all we all cross our fingers and hope that things get much more regularized in that sense yeah yeah and that's exactly the approach that they've taken to to effectively productize um you know all of those different processes and to be you know much more um easily repeatable much more quickly repeatable with you know the intention that if something currently takes you know nine to twelve months from you know a request for a site through to reaching some sort of agreement you know and nine to 12 months can sometimes be optimistic i have to say mm. <laughs> get that down to you know three to six months even then that's that's you know half the amount of time that that's taken and that's good for everyone it's it's good for you know the uk because it helps deliver the better coverage that that everyone wants and you know government want individuals want and businesses certainly want um, and it's good for the the operators because, you know, it means that they can spend more of their time deploying things and, and improving the network and slightly less time um, being, you know, um, bogged down with complex negotiations. Yeah. And and from from the projects that you guys have seen and been involved with, were any were there any specific themes of barriers that came up was it was it different for say the guys in the west midlands as it was for you know the folks in glasgow or or was it sort of the same you know we, we need a barrier buster team <laughs> across all of them were there, were there any common themes i think generally speaking um the common themes were that things um you know take too long and um, that, that there was not really the need for every single negotiation to be completely bespoke from the ground up, you know, because there's a lot of commonality. And um, so, you know, can we not make that a bit more repeatable? Um, and I guess, and, and challenges on both sides of, you know, having the right contacts in the other um, organization to, to kind of make this run as smoothly as possible. Um, you know, as I say, all of those organisations are big and complex and sometimes it's just getting the right person involved in the discussion can make the, the world a difference. And one of the key challenges that I just wanted us to, to touch upon is obviously around procurement. Um, you know, we've talked about, you know, the various sites, the masts, the, the expanse of the UK and the requirements and that obviously has its own procurement challenges. Uh, Neil, can you give us a bit of data, a bit of insight onto what the key procurement challenges are at the moment? Well, when you talk about procurement, you you mean procurement from a supplier trying to procure services to roll out a network, or are you talking about government, um, such as the BDUK Gigabit Programme procurement? Which, which... <laughs> Both. Um, we might be here all day, I suppose, um, from the uh, sort of the operator supplier side. 
I think from the supplier side, there's 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 a couple of major um, uh, issues, challenges just now. Uh, one is resource, uh, for sure. Mm. Uh, it seems to be a common theme, particularly post Brexit, um, uh, and that is getting resource uh, to plan and build and operate networks. And that resource uh, is is wide ranging. Fiber planners, for instance. Um, and, you know they're they're particularly sought after at the moment. Um, and we also have you know the guys digging up the road till they duct. Uh, that is a skilled job. You need mm. you need certified. You know you, it's not it's not what you think it is. It, it is a skilled job. Um, and you know you need to be new roads and street works are certified to dig up and reinstate etc. Uh, yeah, riggers for towers. A uh, lot of um, uh, very attractive uh, rigging jobs going in places like Australia and um, you know other places where it's the weather is considerably nicer than uh, it is. <laughs> you imagine like being what you mean? <laughs> uh, you can imagine being up a mast on a day like it is today in the freezing cold when you could be up a mast in Australia or South Africa or somewhere. So there's 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 definitely resource. Um, uh, constraints uh, across the board, across all the uh, elements that you need to, as I say, design, uh, build and operate networks. Um, uh, the other one is equipment and uh, fiber uh, lead times for equipment. So, you know, there's a worldwide demand for, for fiber for gigabit connectivity. So the demand for fiber dries up the lead time and the cost for fiber. Cost is still relatively good, but it's 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 going the wrong direction. Um, then there's the chip issue, of course, that we've got just now. Uh, that has an impact on um, a fiber uh, kit. Um, uh, now the lead times are, are, if you place an order now, I think you'd be lucky to get anything by the end of March uh, for optical equipment. So um, that's also an issue at the moment. Uh, and then just I think there's 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 a lot of alt nets uh, operating in areas. Some areas have got more than others. And so local authorities, particularly the planning and the roadworks department, uh, you know, they've got resource constraints on them. And so they've got lots of operators coming to them. And so that kind of slows down slightly as, as well. Um, but yeah, mainly, mainly resource and definitely uh, equipment are the, the, the two things that's that's really the main challenges for suppliers at the moment. And Steve, um, just talking about difficulties with infrastructure and procurement, how, obviously we had the incident with Huawei uh, quite recently, how, how has that practically impacted the industry um, and specifically issues around procurement? Yeah, I mean, it, obviously those decisions were made, you know, for, for good reason. Um, you know, the security of the telecoms infrastructure is, is kind of paramount and um, we all use it, whether it's for our personal data, whether it's for, <coughs> excuse me, whether it's for government data. Um, you know, we, we all use telecoms infrastructure all, all day, every day. Um, but what that means is that, you know, because um, of, you know, changes to legislation, changes to, to um, you know, the 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 suppliers who are deemed to be um you know potentially insecure um lots of that equipment already exists in the network at the moment so operators are having to really divert money that they would have normally had allocated to you know upgrades of their network expanding their network to, to areas where they didn't currently serve and lots of that money as i say has been diverted to having to replace equipment like huawei Take, taking it out of the network and replacing it with another supplier um you know that that's both a financial impact because that you know that money's been diverted elsewhere to to deal with that issue mm. but it also actually has an issue you know an impact on resource because you know to neil's point if you've got people you know out there um you know replacing kit in a cabinet at the side of a street or at the top of a mast or, or wherever um you know, that's the same resource that would have been building a um, new network or upgrading network. So, you know, the, it's a double whammy. It's a financial hit, but it also consumes resource to go and retrospectively take that equipment out and and replace it with a suitable alternative. Um, and, and again, to Neil's point, 
you know, finding availability of equipment that is a suitable replacement um, is not very easy at the moment either. There are, there are only so many large players um, who make that kind of equipment and, and everyone is suffering from the same issues of impact to cost, whether that's to do with, you know, with chip shortage, whether it's to do with energy prices, you know, driving up the cost of production, uh, you know, all of those things are impacted. And just just on the point of costs, obviously we know the rent um, sort of valuation regime has has been altered um, as a result of the new code. Uh, and you've just touched on the cost, the impact of the the Huawei incident uh, in terms of cost for operators, but are there any other cost challenges that operators are facing, or or do we think we've covered the, the no, main there, ones? No, I think I think there are, um, and and you touched on it right at the beginning, um, Lucy, in the introduction that you know one of the things that lots of people fail to take into account is, um, you know, historically, if we we'll use mobile operators as as an example, so historically, mobile operators made money from um, selling you know a number of minutes to people to be able to make calls um or selling text messages to people um or picture messages if, if people still remember using those um and that's how they generated their revenue so you know you paid an amount for your phone you paid an amount for your allowance uh, of use of those things um and that's what funded their network and um, as we've all found um we don't use those things very much anymore um you know yes people still make calls but almost all mobile phone contracts these days come with a significant amount of calls, in many cases unlimited. So, you know, the, the operators aren't really able to recoup their costs necessarily on that. Um, and in terms of the, the text messages, et cetera, um, everyone switched to using, you know, whether it's WhatsApp, whether it's Facebook Messenger, whether it's, you know, a whole myriad of other things, um, you know, the, the type of communication that we're doing for this this. Um, call we're having now um, and operators don't don't have any way of monetizing that at the moment you know they they provide the data that we consume to use these other services but they certainly don't get an amount of money for every whatsapp message you send or every thing that you post on instagram or every netflix movie that you watch and um, that all just comes out of the the data allowance that you get and what everyone wants is they want faster data um, hence the upgrade, you know, to 4G and 5G and, you know, the many other Gs that will come after it. <laughs> um, and they also want, you know, so faster, but also more. You know, people want to move, watch a movie in better quality. People want, you know, to, to download more stuff. So, you know, it, it's a challenging environment for the mobile operators, certainly, to kind of recoup that cost. And and it's a similar position for the, the fixed operators. You know, we all use... Um, you know, the likes of Netflix or Amazon Prime or lots of streaming services, you know, significant amount of, of media is consumed in that way or, you know, Apple Music, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera, mm. um, which again, the fixed operators don't really, you know, get any return from those things. They're just expected to provide more data and faster data so we can consume all the services that they make no money from. So it is a very challenging environment for the fixed and mobile operators in terms of how they now, you know, how they earn revenue that pays for the operation of the network and the expansion and, and you know, ongoing maintenance of the network. And um, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we've seen just how important it is to our own personal lives, you know, what with COVID and remote working and, you know, the need to find a new way of doing things was so much more reliant upon it. Um, Neil, where just, just you know, we, we've covered a huge amount of stuff here, but just where does the business opportunity lie then for operators in the context, um, you know, looking at the opportunities there with, uh, you know, achieving 85% capability within the next three years? Uh, the opportunity for network operators is obviously with the um, when we look at uh, mass market gigabit um, broadband to residential and business uh, uh, premises, the market opportunity is to is to uh, cities or towns, um, you know, particularly where there is no gigabit connectivity or planned gigabit connectivity. 
Um, um, so market towns, um, you large. Obviously, we've seen announcements the likes of, you know, we're situated here in Edinburgh, and it's, um, um, you know, it's a gigabit city. I think there are three providers who provide gigabit connectivity. Um, so in terms of um, 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 other alternates coming into that area, might be a bit crowded, but there are market towns where there are none. So mm. opportunity, opportunity there. I mean, operators, alternates, the business case is they need to go for numbers. They need numbers. So where do you get the numbers? You get the numbers in your towns and market towns and, and, and cities. So there is a business opportunity for them, um, for operators. Uh, in targeting to particular areas uh, and they each have their own business plan as to why they target a particular area and why not. And that all, of course, with all the operators together leads to the 85% capability within the next three years. The problem is that they're doing that on a commercial basis. So commercially, their own investment, they can get to that kind of 85%, 80 to 85% most likely. The problem comes beyond the 85%. You know, F20 was originally called the final 20%. Um, that was the BD UK programme. Of course, within that final 20%, there's a final five, there's a final one. Mm. Now, and what, and what, what might that mean then for our remote rural communities? Well, the business opportunity there um, is, is predominantly, it's a gap funded uh, model where uh, UK government will provide the, the subsidy, uh, the gap from what would be in your commercial model to what is in the model in a particular F20 area. So there is the gap funded uh, element, but it means that we're getting more and more rural, of course, and you're having mm. to go longer and further and premises are less clustered. So you have to put more infrastructure in the ground to get more premises. That's why you need the gap funding approach. There does come a point uh, where even for operators, the gap funding model doesn't work. You can throw as much capex as you want at a particular very hard to reach area, um, but it still doesn't entice us to go there because of the opex side. So there becomes an issue there, and that is fixed line. Um, the cost for fixed line to get to these very hard to reach premises, do we now need to look at alternative technologies such as uh, maybe fixed wireless access, um, you know, and at the end of the day, possibly satellite or mm. 4G, is 4G sufficient enough to provide connectivity, maybe through on the back of the emergency services program in these areas. So there will come a point where there are premises that are just um, you know, trying to get fibre connectivity to them is just um, is just impossible. Doesn't cost in, so we need to look at alternative methods uh, of delivery for them. And 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 hopefully the picture will be more clearer within that within that three year twenty twenty five time scale. The further you get fibre into the hinterland then it certainly starts to eat into that um, uh, uh, the the cost to providing uh, to premises that are even further out. Mm. So, you know, for instance, if you could get fibre to a mass site and then get, you know, let's say a direct point to point radio link between that one and another one and then serve maybe fixed wireless access to a small community, then the key is getting fibre out as far as possible uh, so that we can certainly cut the cost to these remote rural communities. And, and, you know, the, the sort of the key thing that um, perhaps sometimes gets lost with, with all with all the chatter of, you know, of practicalities and technical issues is, you know, it's about improving access to healthcare, isn't it? It's about improving access to opportunity for, for communities and, and things like that. Connectivity, um, connectivity underpins pretty much everything that you spoke about in your introduction, you yeah. know. Um, and not only does it uh, underpin um, greater use of apps, digital healthcare, social care, it underpins the economic viability of an area. And some of our very remote rural communities in Scotland, that underpins depopulation. You know, mm. they for people to stay in an area and work because of connectivity. Um, mm. It's it's incredibly important. It underpins pretty much all 
of the information, uh, you know, the IoT, uh, Internet of Things, digital connectivity. Um, it underpins the health and social care. Uh, you you kind of name it. Yeah. Whew, OK, um, so just to sort of wrap up there, there's obviously lots of challenges for the industry um, that we've explored, but it sounds like there's opportunities to um, hopefully uh, people's cups of tea haven't gone too cold um, with, with our chatter, but just want to say a huge thanks to Neil and Steve from Farpoint for joining us today um, and to Scott also um, for his time. It's been a great however many minutes we've been on for. Um, hopefully we haven't gone over an hour uh, and we look forward to welcoming you all to our next web chat um, in the new year. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. <laughs>